Okay, good morning. Good afternoon. Depends where you're at. I'm um, going to get a quick couple minutes to let attendees populate in here. This is a popular one. All right, still going. Still going. <laughs> all right, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for taking some time to uh, join us for our Social Security Insight presentation today. A couple quick administrative items. I do have the chat box open as well as the question and answer box open. Um, feel free. I will do my absolute best while I'm presenting to answer any questions as they come in. At a minimum, I'll make sure I hit them at the end of the presentation. Uh, we are also recording this presentation, so if you happen to miss anything or would like to have a copy of it afterwards, happy to send that out. It will be on our website in the next couple of days as well, if you have any friends or colleagues who you'd like to share it with as well. Um, but let's go ahead and get started. So uh, my name is James Bogart. I am CEO and President of Bogart Wealth. Uh, Bogart Wealth is a registered investment advisory firm. We're managing uh, just under $1.4 billion of client assets now. It's uh, about 800 households nominally. About 90% of those are from the energy sector. Uh, Bogart Wealth is true fiduciaries for our clients. It means that we're legally obligated to put your interest above our own. Um, our core competencies are financial planning, investment management, tax optimization, as well as tax planning. Um, we have now 19 folks on our team. Uh, I need to add uh, Jason Michelle just joined us uh, this last week, as well as four on our tax team. We have three office locations, one in McLean, Virginia, one in Houston, Texas, and one in the Woodlands, Texas. And our mission is to help our clients achieve financial peace of mind by preserving and maximizing intergenerational wealth. Uh, you know, your, your kids, your parents, we found can be some of the largest variables of anyone's financial plan. We've made it part of our firm's culture to integrate them in the process, but also give them access to certified financial planners. Uh, I like to commonly ask the question of what would you do differently now that you know what you know, but maybe back in your 20s or 30s. Um, and, and a lot of times it's you do some things differently. Now, uh, today's presentation is part of a series that we've been doing now for several years. And uh, we do one on the retirement planning timeline. We do one on retirement income planning, one on tax planning, as well as any tax law changes, one on estate planning, as well as estate planning strategies, one on net unrealized depreciation and post-retirement strategies, one on long-term care, as well as long-term care insurance, one on Roths versus traditional 401ks and IRAs, and then last but certainly not least is mega backdoor Roth conversions. You know, one of the things that we've done is, is realize that there's a lot of things that people have questions on. At a minimum, if you'd like us to present on something, uh, just send us a note. Uh, we'll add it to an existing presentation, or if it's justified, I'll do a totally separate presentation. But all of these are recorded. Uh, they're all up on our website. And uh, we're delighted to do it. I really do believe in, in education and, and being able to talk about these things. And frankly, these, these virtual platforms have given us the ability to scale this a lot easier than, than doing live events. All right, so today we're going to talk a lot about Social Security today. And, and the main agenda I want to get through is, is will Social Security be there for you? And, you know, in order to do any type of Social Security planning, you have to embrace the whole concept that Social Security will actually be there. And I want to hopefully alleviate some of the myths around uh, Social Security and then potentially some of the changes that we think are going to be happening. We're also going to talk about how much to expect to receive, uh, when should you apply for Social Security, how to maximize your benefits, and, and will Social Security be enough to live on in retirement? And I think we all know the answer to that question is most likely not. But to get there, you know, we, we really want to start with why is this so important? What is the magnitude of Social Security? And just to kind of give a very, very basic example, you know, if, if your monthly benefit for Social Security is $2,000 today and you live for 10 more years, uh, it is estimated just using a 2.7% cost of living adjustment that you're going to receive $302,000 worth of benefits. If you live for 20 years, it's $666,456. If you live 30 years, it's $1.141 million. So very significant amount of money. Now, on the same token, 
if uh, your monthly benefits $2,000 today, and, and if we look at just what annual cost of living adjustments have been, uh, historically, if you use a, a 40 year average, it's closer to 2.7%. If you're using a 20 year number, it's closer to 2.1%. But really for illustrative purposes, we're trying to demonstrate that social security, the, the benefits are growing. So if the benefit today is $2,000, and in 10 years, just using normal colas, that's going to become $2,611. In 20 years, it's going to be $3,408. And in 30 years, it's going to be $4,448. Those are monthly numbers. So it can be a very significant portion of a person's income stream. So when we talk about Social Security, we're going to be talking about retirement benefits for the retiree. We're going to be talking about retirement benefits for spouses. We're going to be talking about retirement benefits for children. I'll also talk about survivor benefits and maximizing survivor benefits, as well as disability benefits and death benefits. But before we get into it, you know, the real question is, will Social Security actually be there for you? And, and you know, this is becoming a very hot topic, especially as more and more baby boomers are starting to claim their Social Security benefits. But it's important to remember that when Social Security was founded in 1935, it was never designed to replace 100% of anyone's income. It's all based upon how much you're spending. But in terms of where the, the Social Security Trust stands today, um, as of the end of 2019, the Social Security Trust was at $2.897 trillion. And if we look at the activity for 2020, uh, 2020 as we went through the year, they had inflows of $1.059 billion. They had expenditures of $1.053 billion, uh, which is a net increase of about $6 billion, and it finished the year at $2.902 trillion. Now, people say that's a lot of money, uh, but at the end of the day, we look at the percentage of those claiming Social Security benefits, it is increasing. And so right now, when we look at just the current trajectory, and this is giving a little bit more of a historical pro projection, the Social Security Trust Fund has essentially started to flatten out and it is predicted that it will be fully depleted in 2035, which then means that they will only be able to pay out what is currently coming in to offset. Now, there is a little bit of a delta here. Um, and and when, what we're looking at is the OA, OASI numbers, which is old age securities insurance, as well, excuse me, old age survivor insurance, as well as disability insurance. Now, we are in, we already have gotten to a point where the cost is ex exceeding the, excluding the interest in 2010. And we are at a point where in 2021, it's anticipated that the cost will exceed total income. And then, as I mentioned, uh, the trust is, is anticipated to be depleted in 2034 if we're only looking at the OASI numbers. Now, if we're looking at the disability insurance numbers, we're anticipating that that portion of the trust will be depleted this year. Uh, the cost will exceed total income in 20, 2023. And then in 2065, it will be fully depleted as well. And so the point is, is that without any level of reform, they're right. Um, they're only going to be able to pay out 83 cents of, of every dollar that they're currently promising in 2035. And that's assuming no level of reform. Now, we've been here before. In the late 80s, during the Reagan administration, this was a similar conversation that was being had. And all of a sudden, they went through, they made some more uh, broad scope Social Security reform. That's specifically when they increased full retirement age from 66 up to 67. They increased the wage base. And now, all of a sudden, as they made those adjustments, Social Security was to be solvent for the next 75 years. Well, go figure, it hasn't actually been 75 years, but we're having these same conversations all over again. And so, you know, realistically, we are anticipating some reform that, that are going to happen. So uh, as I mentioned, the Social Security uh, Trust is predicted to run out of money um, in, in 2034 into 2035. But, you know, if we increase the maximum earnings subject to Social Security, up from 100% uh, of the median wage up to 250% of the median wage. That's one of the solutions that's being studied. Um, they also have talked about indexing cost of living adjustments. They've also talked about increasing payroll taxes up from 6% up to 7.65% on worker and the employer. 
Um, and then, as I mentioned, they raised full retirement age, which is the original age of 65 increased to 66. And then for those born from 1943 to 1954, it stayed at 66. Um, and at the time, you guys were 29 to, to 40 years old. And then for anybody born 1960 or later, they increased full retirement age up to age 67. Um, they also added some new workers into the system. Um, in 1983, they actually added in federal employees as well. And then they also increased the taxability of Social Security. So those were reforms we've already seen. And then here's some ones that are now being proposed and being studied. But uh, one of the things that they've talked about is increasing maximum earnings subject to Social Security tax above the current number. I got a little typo on the slides here, I apologize. In 2021, the maximum wage base is 142,800. But if they remove that cap and, and made Social Security subject to all earned income, that would actually fix 76% of the funding gap. So for baby boomers, that's not gonna actually have any impact. It'll, it'll be more of a dramatic impact for those that are still earning and working. Um, if they increase the normal retirement age again, so as I mentioned earlier, it's currently 66 for those born 1943 to 1954, and it's 67 for those born after 1960. But just raising the uh, uh, full retirement age up to age 69 for those that were born 2008 or later would resolve 39% of the funding gap or potentially lower benefits for future retirees. Uh, and, and this is, we've seen a couple different uh, solutions proposed here, uh, but specifically adjusting the primary insurance amounts and how social security is calculated. That could potentially also be one of the solutions. And, and the one that I could see that is a more dramatic reform that we would have happen is reducing cost of living adjustments for all retirees. And to be honest, I think that this is the only one that if you're a baby boomer or, or eminently going to be planning for Social Security, it's the only one that it, that's on the radar that would cause any level of concern. And it's not having a cost of living adjustment that is accurately reflective of what inflation is really doing. Um, and that's the one that in my mind is the most detrimental or potentially detrimental for a retiree. But the essence of my point is, is that I do think that reform is coming. We've already seen some level of reform in 2015. They, they modified some of the filing strategies, you know, but Social Security reform is one of those political hot buttons that really no politician really wants to go after because it could impact re-election. Um, not that I'm cynical at all, but the fact is, is it's probably not going to be adjusted dramatically for some years. But you really do need to make the assumption that some level of Social Security will be in uh, your, your long-term retirement plan. So to do this, we got to talk a little bit about how much you can expect to receive. And, and as I mentioned, Social Security, again, never designed to replace 100% of anyone's income. You know, and so what we have to do is look at how much you've earned over your working career, what your year of birth is, and then the age at which you're going to be applying for Social Security benefits. Now, at age 62, that is the first time your Social Security is ever actually officially calculated. Everything prior to that is an estimate. Uh, but what they do is at age 62, they look at each year's earnings and they're tallied up and they're indexed to medium wage inflation. They look at the highest 35 years of earnings and they average them. It's called your AIM, Averaged Index Monthly Earnings. Then that AIM is divided by three bend points to determine what is called the primary insurance amount or PIA. And this is the amount that you're anticipated to receive at full retirement age, whatever your respective full retirement age is. And then that benefit is increased each year by cost of living adjustments based on whatever the consumer price is for inflation. And so we can see kind of just accurately with history here, if someone is living on $11,952 a year, Social Security will replace 90% of what they're spending. Uh, for somebody who's living on $72,024 a year, it will replace 42% of what they're spending. If they're living on right at the maximum wage base, so this is the maximum amount that's eligible for Social Security taxes, which is $142,800, it will replace 27% of someone's, someone's standard of living. Now, theoretically, Social Security replaces zero, right? If you have in, unlimited income, uh, it will not be a very significant replacement factor for you. But 
dependent upon what you are spending in, in your situation, it can have still a, a more meaningful impact. Now, what we found is for most energy employees, as they're retiring, it's replacing anywhere from 30% down to as low as 10%. But again, it's a function of what you're earning. Now, here's the actual calculation itself. So, and this is just showing you an example, but this is a baby boomer born in 1958. It's turning 62 now at the end of the year. Um, but we're assuming that they've been at the maximum social securities earnings every year since they were 22 years old. So their average index monthly earnings is $10,296. So then we have to calculate this primary insurance amount formula. And, and this is very formulaic. Now these breakpoints do adjust every single year. But for example, the first $960, well, 90% of that is going to create a monthly check for you of $864. So, and then the next $4,825, that's going to be replaced at 32%. It creates an additional $1,544. And then the remaining $4,871 is replaced at 15%. That's an additional $730.80. That then tallies up to $3,138.80. This would be this person's primary insurance amount. So that, again, this is an individual as at the end of 2020, at they've been at the maximum wage base their entire career since they were 22. That's the maximum amount they're gonna get at their full retirement age. Now, because they're born in 1958, they're not gonna, their full retirement age will actually be uh, 66 and eight months. And here's actually how we determine those. So as I mentioned before, if you were born between 1943 and 1954, your full retirement age is age 66. If you're born 1960 or later, your full retirement age is 67. Now, if you're born in 1955 through 1959, there's an incremental rise for what your full retirement age would be. So for example, someone born in 1955, it's their full retirement age is 66 in two months. 1956, it's 66 in four months. And in two month increments all the way down until 1960 or later, it's at age 67. All right. So with, um, uh, someone just said we're having some volume issues. I'll try to speak a little louder. Now, what if you wanna apply for your benefits early? Now, what we're looking at is you do have the ability to apply for social security as early as the age of 62. Now with doing so, we talked about the primary insurance amount is what you would receive at your full retirement age. But if you decided you wanted to actually claim earlier, it would actually cause them to do a reduction of your benefit. So if your full retirement age is 66, then you're gonna get approximately a 25% reduction. If your full retirement age is 67, it's gonna approximately be a 30% reduction. Important to know that. So especially if we're gonna claim early. Now, Social Security has this overarching concept called deemed filing, which means whatever the best possible claiming option is for you is going to have a carrying impact into any future claiming options for you. This is important to talk about when we get into spousal benefits. But why I'm mentioning it now is, is because if a spouse decides to claim their own benefit early, i.e. take a reduction, then that also means when they go and turn on their spousal benefits, they're also going to have that same reduction apply. Now, there's also an additional enhancement or, or benefit called delayed retirement credits, annual delayed credits, which is you actually have the ability to delay taking your Social Security all the way up until age of 70. So if your full retirement age is age 66, meaning you were born 1954 or earlier, you can actually receive up to 132% of what your benefit would have been if you had taken it at age 62, uh, excuse me, at age 66. If your full retirement age is age 67, you have the ability to take it as, uh, uh, delay it up until 70 as well, but you could receive up to 124% of what your benefit would have been. So it's important to understand the concepts of if you claim it early, you get a discount. If you delay, you get an enhancement. So part of this is we got to look at the numbers. And so with the numbers, uh, there's a couple different ways of getting estimates. One is going to the socialsecurity.gov, my statement, um, or you can go on and click and, and select the estimate your retirement benefits. 
And then they do have some very basic benefit calculators um, on the, the Social Security website as well. All right, so let's talk a little bit about spousal benefits. And I, and I already kind of introduced this whole concept with deemed filing, but spousal benefits means that a spouse is entitled to half of a primary, of a primary worker's primary insurance amount at the full retirement age. So quick example, let's just say John's primary insurance amount is 2000. Jane's primary insurance amount is, is 800. If Jane applies at full retirement age, her benefit's gonna be $1,000, it's half of John's. You get whatever is the better for, for you. Now, um, sorry, I had a quick question come in. Do you think Social Security might allow, for, uh, allow in future an additional delay up to age 72 for an additional percentage increase given we are all living longer? Um, you know, I've heard that as a rumor that they might continue the delayed retirement credits, but I think the only way they're gonna do that is if they sequence it with in increasing full retirement age. Um, and, and that's gonna have more of an impact on younger non-eligible to claim right now. But I don't necessarily think for anybody who's already in that baby booming category that they're gonna also have the ability to get an enhancement as well. Um, if I go online and use the estimate calculator, is that amount based on COLA adjustments between now and my full retirement age? No, it is not. So those are estimates as to what that would be based on that calculation that day. They're not assuming any future uh, income or cost of living adjustments. Great question. All right, I wanna come back to sp uh, spousal benefits. So again, if you're married, um, a spouse is entitled to half of the primary insurance, the, the primary workers or higher income earners primary insurance amount at full retirement age. Um, now, someone asked the question, if a spouse hasn't worked, is she eligible for spousal benefits? Yes, I'm coming there. So some rules for spousal benefits. The primary worker must have filed for their benefits. The spouse must be at least the age of 62 for a reduced benefit or full retirement age for a full benefit. Um, no delayed credits for spousal benefits after full retirement age. All right, so I wanna click back to this example real quick. So let's just say that there's an age gap between John and Jane. And, and let's say that, for example, John is uh, the higher income earner. Social Security is, is not trying to bias one gender versus the other, but let's just assume higher income earner is actually a little bit older. And I'll talk about some claiming strategies here in a few minutes. But John wants to delay taking his benefits to go get that 8% per year. And let's just assume Jane actually has her own earnings history. And let's assume she's four years younger. So she's 62, John's 66. Well, John might decide he wants to delay for the 8% per year credit. But Jane wants to go ahead and start getting something now. So she takes the, let's just use the 25% reduction. So on her own benefit, now she's hit that reduction but it would also impact her spousal benefits once John starts to take his own as well. So let's just say again, $2,000, if Jane's would have been a thousand, because she claimed early for her own, she's only gonna be eligible to receive $750 a month once John starts claiming his. On the same token, um, we talk about John delaying to get his delayed retirement credits. Well the delayed retirement credits do not benefit the spousal benefit. So in this example, let's just assume the maximum amount is $2,000. Jane's spousal benefit maximum amount is $1,000. So the decision to delay for John potentially could actually have an impact on the combined benefit for the household. So we got to talk about all these different timing strategies in terms of what we're going to execute on. All right, and I'm going to come back to a couple more examples. I think it'll make it a little bit clearer. But with regards to benefits for children, we're actually seeing this happen a lot where you can qualify for Social Security retirement benefits if you have young children. So your children might also qualify to receive benefits off of your, your records. So in order to be qualified, um, the child must be unmarried under the age of 18 or 18 to 19 and a full-time student, no higher than high school grade, or 18 and older and disabled from a disability that started prior to the age of 22. Um, the benefits paid for your child will not impact your benefits. 
Now there is a max that does start to apply if you have multiple children, but we are seeing this for, for those that were a little later in life and decided to have children. Now, all of a sudden we have the ability to potentially turn on benefits for them as well. So if you've got younger children, it's just something that we might want to integrate in some of the timing and planning, because not only can you get spousal benefits, but there's also benefits for children as well. Now, this is also one that's starting to become a, a topic of discussion, which is benefits for same-sex couples. Now, same-sex couples marriages in all states are recognized for purposes of determining eligibility for Social Security. Um, there are some non-marital legal relationships, uh, such as civil unions, as well as domestic partnerships, that are also being recognized as well. Uh, they also recognize same-sex marriages and some non-marital legal relationships established in foreign jurisdictions. Um, it does apply to all of the Social Security programs, so retirement, survivor, and disability. And then there's also what are called divorce spouse benefits. Now, um, it's the same as spousal benefits if the marriage lasted for longer than 10 years. The person receiving the divorce spouse benefit is also unmarried, and the ex-spouse is at least the age of 62. Now, the divorce has, if the, um, the if Divorce is more than two years ago. The ex-spouse does not need to have filed their own benefits. Now, a couple things with rules for divorce spouse benefits. More than one ex-spouse can receive benefits on the same worker's record. Um, the benefit paid to one ex-spouse does not affect those paid to the other worker, the current spouse, or other ex-spouses. And divorce spouse benefits stop upon remarriage of the spouse collecting benefits not upon the remarriage of a primary worker, the higher income earner. Um, so interestingly enough, we, we teasingly call this the Donald Trump scenario uh, because of multiple uh, ex-wives that were over 10 years. So there's multiple people who can claim off of his social security history. But we also joke that if you're debating remarriage and potentially relying upon social security benefits uh, from a former spouse, you always wanna look and see what the benefit would be off of the new spouse potentially Again, if you're only looking at it for financial reasons, um, but bad joke, but it is, uh, there is some merit to that. Um, one thing to talk about with divorce spouse benefits and something we get very, very careful on. If you decide to claim off of an ex-spouse and your intent really is to actually delay and get credits off of your own earnings history, that deemed filing concept also comes into play here as well. That if you claim it, for example, a divorce spouse benefit at age 62, well, that reduction has now also applied to your own benefits as well. So be very, very careful here, especially if you're in a scenario where you did have a higher earning spouse and then you went back to work or, or um, whatever the situation may be. We need to look at it holistically and make sure that we're understanding the impact that we're having on your own benefits as well. All right. Survivor benefits. Now, survivor benefits can be very, very, very confusing. The importance of, of knowing or talking about survivor benefits is, is that the decisions that we make for your retirement benefits can actually have an effect on your surviving spouse. So a couple nuances here. Um, there's, there's some related on when you claimed, but also when the survivor claims. So um, the age at which the deceased spouse originally claimed their benefit. So if um, they, they say he, but you know, if the higher earning spouse claimed their benefit prior to full retirement age, the survivor benefit is going to be limited to the higher of the deceased spouse benefit or 82.5% of his primary insurance amount. Now, if he claimed it full retirement age or later, the survivor benefit will get the benefit of those delayed retirement credits. So we talked about the 8% per year that will also translate over into survivor benefits. Now, the second part of survivor benefits is that um, it will also depend upon the age at which the widow claims their survivor benefits. So if she claims before her full retirement age, her survivor benefits gonna be a fraction of the original amount. For example, if, they, if the widow claims, and by the way, widows can claim as early as age 60, um, she will only be eligible for 71.5% of the primary insurance amount. If she claims at her full retirement age or later, her survivor benefit will equal 100% of the original benefit. So I know this is confusing. We, uh, we have several examples to kind of hopefully help 
illustrate this point. But let's just say the spouse dies while receiving regular benefits, the widower will be able to switch to the higher benefit. So we've got Joe and Julie, both are over full retirement age. Joe's benefit is $2,000, Julie's benefit's 1,200. So while they're both alive, they're bringing in $3,200. Now let's assume that uh, Joe passes away. Julie's gonna notify Social Security and her $1,200 benefit is now replaced with a $2,000 benefit, which was Joe's. Now, uh, it, normally in a more interactive environment, I'd ask what's the problem here? But the fact is, is when they were both alive, they were bringing $3,200. Now, Julie, the survivor, is only going to bring in $2,000. So it does cause a cash flow impact, potentially. Now, a couple things with regards to claiming early. So we're still going to talk about uh, Joe and Julie. Joe's primary insurance amount is $2,000. Julie files for Social Security at 62. Excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, Joe files for Social Security at 62. His benefit gets that 25% haircut, so it drops to $1,500. Now, Joe passes away. Julie's got some choices here. Um, so her survivor benefit's gonna depend really on when she claims it. So if Julie claims her survivor benefit at full retirement age or later, her benefit's gonna actually increase a little bit up to 82.5% of Joe's primary insurance amount or $1,650 per month. Now, Julie can also have the choice of claiming as early as age of 60 and her benefit would actually be reduced a little bit further down to 71.5% or $1,430. Um, I had a question come in. Does spousal benefits grow to age 71 also if both are waiting till age 71? So a couple things on that question. There's no reason to wait until past age 70. Benefits do not continue to grow after the age of 70. So once you hit the age of 70, you really should just go get the money. Now, um, going back to talking about spousal benefits, if, if your spouse is a lower earning spouse or did not have earnings history or qualify on their own, they're entitled to half of your full retirement age. If you decide to wait to take your benefits, that actually would impact the ability for your spouse to claim a spousal benefit. But also related to that, the spousal benefit does not increase based on those delayed retirement credits. So this is all part of the economics that have to go into those discussions. But going back to that example of Joe and Julie, where Joe's primary insurance amount was 2000, Julie's was 1000. She could claim at age 62 and get 750, but Joe wants to wait and, and get the accumulation on his. Well, if Joe waits, Julie's only option is to claim on her own history. And she can't, she's not eligible for spousal benefits, but also, Joe, uh, Julie's benefit is maxed out at whatever half of Joe's was at his full retirement age. So if it was 2000, Julie's maximum amount is 1000. Hope that helps. All right. Um, I actually have an example that's getting into that. So um, Joe and Julie are married. Um, Joe's primary insurance amounts 2000. Joe files for Social Security at 70. His, his spousal, uh, excuse me, his benefit increased by the 132%. So his $2,000 went up to $2,640. Now Joe passes away. Julie's benefit can e either be equal to Joe's benefit of $2,640, but again, it will depend based upon when she claims. So Julie can claim as early as the age of 60. Her benefit will be, if she claims it at 60, will be 71.5% of the maximum amount of $2,640, which is $1,887. But then Julie also could wait till her, her full retirement age to get the maximum survivor benefit, which would be $2,640. Now, a couple things with survivor benefits. Um, you know, a couple must have been married for at least nine months at the date of death, uh, except in case of an accident. The survivor must be at least 60 for a reduced benefit, 50 if they are disabled, or full retirement age for a full benefit. The survivor uh, benefit is not available if widower, re, widow or widower remarries before the age of 60, unless that, er that marriage ends. And then divorced spouse survivor benefits are also available if the marriage lasted at least 10 years. So all of this said and done, it's very confusing. And um, I do think it's extremely important to make sure that social security benefits 
are being integrated into your financial plan, there's over 77,000 timing options of when to claim social security benefits for a couple. It's really, really important to understand the impact that you're having because it's not only just your retirement benefits. We are forced to look at social security benefits for the household and what would be the net best benefit for the two of you combined. Um, I had another question come in. Can you please explain the spousal benefit if the other spouse waits until age 70 and they both continue li um, living? <clears throat> Excuse me. So I want to make sure I understand the question. Please explain the spousal benefit if the other spouse waits until age 70 and they both continue living. So it does depend a little bit off of the age differential between the two. But I'll go back to this first slide on spousal benefits and just use this example here. So again, I'm going to assume Joe's primary insurance amount is $2,000. Julie's on her own is $800. So in this example, uh, and I'll talk about discounting first, and then I'll talk about delayed retirement credits. Um, Joe could take it early and take 25% reduction, which would bring it down to 1500. Julie could take hers early and take hers down to $600. Now, Julie, if she decided to take hers down to $600 because she took the discounts, that same discount would apply to whatever her spousal benefit is once Joe starts claiming if Joe decided he didn't want to take his early. By the way, that same discounting that Joe does would also apply to Julie. So going back and saying, let's say Joe's primary insurance amount is 2000 at full retirement age. If he claims as early as age 62, he would then drop his to 1500. That means the maximum eligible for spousal benefits that Julie could receive is 750. All right, so that's discounting. Let's talk about um, delayed retirement credits. So I just showed an example a moment ago that again, assuming Joe's full retirement age is 66, if he decides to wait until full retirement age, his 2000 becomes $2,640. Now, if he waits, that impacts Julie's eligibility to be able to actually claim a spousal benefit. So in, in the example of they're both the exact same age, that means, and let's just assume Julie doesn't have her own earnings history, then what that would do is that means that Julie can't claim anything until Joe starts claiming his at age 70. Now, let's use the example here, where if Julie has her own earnings history, and let's just say the $800, Julie can actually go ahead and start claiming, and I'm assuming they're the same age, Julie can go ahead and start claiming her own benefit for $800, when she hits full retirement age. And then when Joe starts to claim his at full retire at uh, age 70, she can come back and get her $800 benefit increased up to 1,000. The key thing here though is Julie's survivor benefit does not get the benefit, I'm sorry, I said survivor. Uh, Julie's spousal benefit, excuse me, does not get the benefit of those delayed retirement credits. It never increases over the primary insurance amount at full retirement age. Um, sorry, <laughs> I keep changing the names up. I should just have the names be the same. Um, all right, my, my birthday is in September. My full retirement age is 66 and four months. And I want to delay social security until I am 67. Uh, do I have to wait the full 12 months and file when I'm 66, 67 and four months? or can I get the additional 8% when I turn 67 in September, four months earlier? Um, so it's completely prorated, right? So if your full retirement age is 66 in four months and you decide to wait until 67, then you're effectively gonna be able to get eight twelfths of, is that right? Yeah, excuse me, nine twelfths of the 8% discount, uh, uh, delayed retirement credit. So you'll get 6% roughly. All right. Great questions. I appreciate the questions. Some of these webinars lately haven't had any questions coming in. So it's nice to kind of break up the, the rhythm. So I want to talk a little bit about when should I apply for benefits? And um, really, this is all specific to you, but we need to look at your health status, your life expectancy, need for income, whether or not you plan to work, and then also any type of survivorship needs. So first question is, 
why delay benefits? Well, we've already talked about discounting. We've already talked about delayed retirement credits, but we need to talk about the benefit of cost of living adjustments. So in, in this example, and as we've talked about, if somebody's full retirement age is 66, when they claim at 66, they get 100% of their, their benefit, no discounting. Now, if they claim as little as, uh, as early as age 72, they actually take a 25% discount. So in this example, um, and this is the primary insurance amount of $2,742, which was the maximum wage base last year, um, that would then mean that that benefit would be reduced all the way down to $2,057 if this person took it as early as age 62. Now, we do assume that if they get the benefit of cost of living adjustments. If they claim as early as 62, now the amount that you start with is smaller and those colas don't magnify as dramatically. Whereas if somebody were to wait and claim at age 70, they're gonna get $3,619. And the point with this is that the, the impact of taking the discount early really does dramatically amplify in later years. And here's really kind of illustrating that point. If you claimed at the age of 62, when you turn 70, your benefit is now $2,545. If you waited and because of the benefit of cost of living adjustments, your benefit is now $4,479. So that 2,742 bucks with the 8% plus cost of living adjustments has a very dramatic delta between the two. And then you kind of extrapolate this whole conversation out to, all right, if you're 80, now that number is $3,322 versus $5,847. Now, I haven't had somebody ask me the question yet, but I know it's coming. Obviously the decision between waiting to, to claim until 70 means that if you were to have claimed it at 62, you've got that additional eight years worth of benefits that would come in. And so we have to look at what the break-even analysis is on the decision of how long do you need to live if you were to decide to wait. And so what we look at is, first off, the decision from 62 versus 67 for a single individual means that they need to live between ages of 77 and 78 to justify delaying. Um, the decision to wait from 62 to 70, you need to live to age 80 or 81. From 66 until 70, age 82 to 83. Now this is a single individual. We actually have married, it brings those ages down because of survivor benefits. All right, um, I've had a couple questions come in that I wanna come back to and make sure that I don't miss anything. Um, I saw a slide that said divorced spouse can not be remarried to collect benefits. I seem to remember seeing online that a divorced spouse could collect if remarried and over and or 60 or over. Please advise. Thank you. So in that in that question um, around divorced spouse benefits, if a spouse remarries, then they're going to be looking at it based upon their spousal benefits for their new partner. So it does not necessarily have an impact on your own. It would never will. But ultimately, if they are going to get remarried and then stay remarried, it's now going to be based upon the new partner spousal benefits, not off of your earnings history. All right. Um, couple questions here. Are you saying that waiting until 70 not only has an 8% per year increase, but also the cumulative cost of living adjustments? Yes, that's exactly what I'm saying. You know, the, the whole concept of this slide was not only are you getting the delayed retirement credits, but you're also getting the benefit of cost of living adjustments. And so a lot of the discussions I'm having with our clients around timing with Social Security, it really is integrating cash flows, but it's also understanding the impact that this is having not only to your retirement benefits, to the spousal benefits, but also the survivorship benefits. And going back to this slide here, this is actually assuming, again, if you decided to wait until 70 and you claim at 70, that $4,479 benefits, that's also what the survivorship benefit would be based off of, including the delayed retirement credits. Um, someone asked at what discount rate or what rate of return are you assuming? All right, so great question. 
For the accumulation, we're just using cost of living adjustments, which is 2.7%. For this break-even analysis, we're assuming a 5.5% rate of return with the same 2.7% cost of living adjustment inflation number. So it's nominally a 2.8% real rate of return annually to do this analysis. All right, I had another question come in. I apologize, I'm trying to get all of them. Do you, um, would, uh, could you, would you please explain the maximum family benefit? Our social security statement says that it is less than 150% of claimants benefit. Yes, so what's happening when, when you have maximum family benefits, this is really specifically the case where you've got kids claiming off of it or potentially multiple ex-spouses claiming off of it. What they do is they aggregate the total lifetime benefits. They take 150% of that, and then they aggregate out and max out each person who can claim off of that. Um, we do need to run a side-by-side -side calculation if that's one of the strategies that we're going to be looking to claim off of. Okay. All right. Hopefully back on track here. <sighs> So when to apply for social security benefits? It is, it, it is very, very important to remember that if you apply early, your benefit does start lower and it stays lower for life. Those cost of living adjustments magnify the impact of, of claiming early or delaying claiming the benefits. The longer you live, the more beneficial it is to, to um, delay those benefits. And some of that conversation, as you look at family history, you look at your own health history, but also make sure you factor in your spouse's history um, because those impacts have a dramatic impact on those survivorship benefits as well. Um, and you know, when we look at the single life versus joint life for a couple who are both the age of 65, um, only a 50% chance that both will be alive at age 85, but there is a chance that one of the two of you, 50% uh, will live to age 92, 25% chance that one of you is going to live to 96, and a 10% chance that one of you will live to the age of 99. The point is, is that people are living longer, and if we're looking at the mortality off of a couple, it is important to factor that into the decision that we're going to have for spousal benefits. All right, so let's talk a little bit about how to maximize the benefits. So the first thing is, let's look at what is your earnings history. And let's look at ways to potentially improve your earnings history. I do always recommend, let's look at your earnings record for your latest social security statement. Let's make sure it's accurate. Make sure nothing is missing. And if there's anything that we can do to potentially improve it, one of which of those suggestions is maybe it's just working longer. Um, and, and so we typically don't see it for like the career employees who have worked at one company their entire career. But we do absolutely see it for the non-career spouse who's changed jobs. And, and all of a sudden, there's been some reporting delay or lag. We want to make sure that all that earnings history is in there. Now, we talk about applying it at an optimal time. So what we need to factor in is your income needs both now and in the future. And related to that conversation, I would also say we need to factor in what your portfolio balances are. We need to factor in life expectancy as well as your spouse's, spouse's life expectancy. Now, one other comment that I would always like to bring up, let's just say you're gonna retire before your full retirement age. And if you happen to go back and, 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 you, and your plan is to go ahead and claim social security at age 62, make sure that if you decide to go back and work, you understand what that impact will be on your benefits as well. So if you uh, apply for Social Security prior to your full retirement age and you decide to go back and work, there is a dollar reduction in benefits for, or excuse me, withholding of benefits for every $2 you earn over the maximum allowable wage, which is $18,960 in 2021. So if you're going to make over, just say $19,000 and you're taking Social Security benefits, you're actually going to also experience a withholding off of those. Um, those benefits will be adjusted back at full retirement age, but I'm always one to say, don't let the annual earnings test discourage you from working. I'd rather have earned income than off of a potential reduction of benefit, uh, but also to avoid the earnings test, just wait until full retirement age. If you have other assets to be able to live off of, really consider that. And, and this whole discussion for me really is, and, and part of the conversation we're having is, treat social security in some ways like an investment. 
you know, there's nothing that we can do that would give you a guaranteed 5% per year plus cost of living adjustments, just like there's nothing we could do that would give you a guaranteed 8% per year for those delayed retirement credits plus cost of living adjustments. So think of it that way, that if you have a portfolio or liquidity to be able to use to, to offset cash flow, integrate into the overall plan. Now, that said, please don't take that as my default recommendation is wait until 70, because that's not always the case. We have to coordinate spousal benefits into this discussion. Because, for example, you could have a lower earning spouse who, when we factor in the impact of, of spousal benefits, in addition to your own benefits, for example, your spouse might be a couple years older than you, so it's not going to have a reduction on their benefits once you start claiming your benefit. The net cash flow between the two of you can actually be more than the benefit of delaying and taking the delayed retirement credits. So it's very, very important to, to look at and coordinate with spousal benefits. Um, sorry, real quick, I wanted to make sure I hit any questions coming in. Um, if I if I retire at age 70, but still want to earn money until 72, will there be an impacting on the withholding? No, sorry, I should have said that. Um, that that um, earnings test that, that applies stops at full retirement age. It only applies from um, early retirement. Um, I think the cost of living is the same of early or late benefits. It is just magnifying over a longer period benefit for late benefits. Yes, that's absolutely true. It's just the cost of living adjustments are magnifying the, the impact, if you will, on cash flows. And so, of course, if you have other assets, same comment that I was making a few moments ago, the longer you wait, the more we're going to see that amplification off of those, um, that the, the discounting mechanism is, as well as the delayed retirement credits. All right, so let's talk a little bit about some spousal claiming strategies. Um, and, and some of these have, have started to change. I made the comment uh, right at the beginning of the presentation that we've seen adjustments in 2015. Well, right here, here it is. But one of the most commonly discussed strategies for, for married couples has been filing and suspending. And it used to be uh, kind of perceived as a double dip, if you will. But what this strategy is, is where a, at full retirement age, the higher earning spouse can apply for their benefit and then ask to immediately suspend it. The reason they would do this is because we talk about spousal benefits, but it would allow the lower earning spouse to go ahead and claim for their spousal benefit and the higher earning spouse to get the delayed retirement credits. So um, Bob and Barbara are both 66. Bob's primary insurance amount is $2,000. Barbara's is $800. Bob wants to delay his benefit until 70, but Barbara wants to go ahead and start getting her spousal benefit. So with this strategy, Bob files and suspends at 66, and this would entitle Barbara to her spousal benefit while Bob's benefits are continuing to get those delayed retirement credits. Now, a couple things here. File and suspend is not eligible prior to full retirement age, but also based on the uh, legislation in 2015, File and suspend is no longer valid for anybody who's um, who started claiming benefits after April of 2016. I bring this slide up not because it's a strategy that's available, but it's something that still gets talked about with regards to claiming strategies. And it's important to know that if you haven't claimed yet or you're over the age to be or excuse me, under the age to be able to claim, it's not going to be something that's available to you anymore. All right. Related to this, um, there's another strategy called claim now, claim more later. This is also being phased out. But this is where at full retirement age, the higher earning spouse restricts their application to their spousal benefit, meaning the lower earning spouse has filed for theirs and they can go ahead, the higher earning spouse can go ahead and take half of the lower earning spouse. And then at 70, higher earning spouse switches to their own benefit to again, go after the delayed retirement credits. Um, this is also not available starting in 2019. Again, I'm bringing it up because these are strategies that get talked about. They're no longer eligible. But just a quick example on this, uh, Mike and Mary, uh, both 66. Mike's primary insurance amount is 2000. Mary's is 800. Mary files for her benefit at age 66. Mike then files for his spousal benefit off of hers. It's now $400. And then when Mike turns 70, he switches on and turns on his um, maximum benefit, including the delayed retirement credits. And then Mary then flips back and turns on her spousal benefit, bringing her $800 up to $1,000. So 
Point is also not available as a strategy, but it was something that people were doing in order to generate additional cash flow. You know, I think ultimately I don't see it coming back. You know, there's been a lot of chatter that it might come back simply because it really did hit the middle class the most, even though it was originally perceived to have the most beneficial impact to the upper class. Um, but I don't see it coming back simply because of the current state of Social Security. And, and frankly, I think there's uh, other items that, that legislation is going to go after more on tax and estate reform before Social Security gets impacted here. All right. How to minimize taxation of your benefits. Now, a couple of things here. A lot of people really get kind of confused with the taxability of Social Security benefits. For most households, it is taxed at 85 cents of every dollar is treated as income. Now, Social Security taxation is actually not based off of taxable income. It's based off of what is called provisional income. Provisional income is your adjusted gross income plus half of what your Social Security benefit would be plus any tax exempt interest. So if you're living off a whole bunch of municipal bonds, very difficult to do in today's age because municipal bonds aren't paying a whole lot. But if you are, that's actually being factored into the math if Social Security benefits are going to be taxed, taxable or not. So uh, for married filing jointly, if you're under $32,000 of income, Social Security benefits aren't taxed at all. If you're between $32,000 and $44,000 of, of, of provisional income, it's taxed at 50%. If you're over $44,000, it's 85% taxed. Single, the thresholds are just slightly lower, under 25,000 um, at 0%, 25 to 34,000 at 50%, over 34,000, it's 85%. And then anyone filing uh, married separately, then it's at, uh, all of it is taxed at 85 cents on the dollar. Couple ways to kind of talk about strategies with regards to um, taxability. So this is where we reduce other income with tax advantage investments, but not municipal bonds. Um, we also want to have this conversation in anticipation of future required minimum distributions, which might put you into a higher tax bracket. So potentially consider starting to draw on IRAs or doing Roth conversions before the age of 72. Um, and for anybody who doesn't know, a required minimum distribution is when you turn 72, you're required to start taking a percentage of your retirement accounts out. So part of that tax optimization work that we're talking about is ways to help mitigate some of the future implications that might happen off of your portfolio. I think it's extremely important to talk about tax efficient withdrawal strategies. Um, this is where we'll also talk about potentially delaying Social Security benefits. It will reduce the number of years of benefits that are subject to tax. Of course, uh, it also reduces the number of years of benefits, but because of the delayed uh, benefits of getting the delayed retirement credits and cost of living adjustments, there could be some merit there. And especially if we're integrating other tax strategies into your plan, it might have a benefit of going ahead and delaying as well, simply because it's less years where we're going to have that Social Security income, which is bringing taxable income up, which is potentially impacting some long-term capital gain strategies or some Roth conversion strategies. So all of that should be factored into a long-term plan. Um, this one I always crack up at, but in order to re uh, avoid or reduce taxability to reduce expenses, pay down debt, adopt a simpler lifestyle. It sounds so easy. Um, and then also, as, as I've talked about, continue to manage taxes through retirement. Now, we do want to coordinate Social Security with your overall retirement plan. And Social Security office, what they can do is they can help you with estimating what your individual benefits are. They can tell you what the amount is that you're entitled to now, but they cannot project future benefits through any type of the scenario planning. They also can't talk about any of the different types of timing strategies and what's going to be the best benefit for you. Um, so I think it's really, really important. If you don't have a plan, you need to have a plan and constantly be revisiting that and understanding the impact that that plan is having, not only on your investment strategies, but on your cash flow strategies as well. And then to come back to that, uh, original question, will Social Security be enough to live on in retirement? Probably not. That's why you got to have other buckets um, and, and really integrating it with the plan. So we want to consider Social Security in the context of any pension income you have, any IRAs or 401k distributions, uh, those required minimum distributions when you hit the age of 72, 
as well as your work situation and your current investment portfolio. But fact is, if you have any questions, we absolutely can help. Uh, we do have a couple of new faces on this one, but uh, part of our call to action with any of the events that we do is to absolutely offer uh, no cost, no obligation financial planning. It's a great way to understand where you're at. We can talk about some of these various different strategies integrated into your plan. And especially when we start talking about executables, um, really, really do highly recommend it. My, my team will follow up after the presentation, see if you have any questions. Uh, I do have a couple of events coming up here in the next couple of weeks on um, next week on March 3rd. I'm going to be talking about how discount rates affect lump sum options. And then on March the 10th, I'm going to be doing retirement income planning. Um, here's all of our contact information. I really do appreciate you spending some time with me uh, this afternoon. And uh, at the end of the presentation, there's going to be a survey. Always do appreciate feedback. How can we do these better? But uh, most importantly, stay healthy, stay well. And if you have any questions or you need anything, please don't hesitate in any way, shape, or form. Reach out. Um, all of our information is listed on here above. Thank you much. Take care.